Here. Senator James. Here. Senator Perkins. Here. Senator Wasserberger. Here. Representative Brown. Here. Representative Gray. Here. Representative Sherwood. Here. Representative Stivar. Present. Vice Chair Senator Boner. Here. Chairman Barlow. Here. Thank you very much. We have a solid quorum to continue with our business today. Um, so just a little housekeeping. Uh, members of the committee, please uh, fill out your reimbursement schedules. So at the end of the day, Carla doesn't have to twist my arm to make sure they get turned in. Um, any members of the committee, any business before we get started with our first presentation? Nope. All right, so let's begin. We have our pleased to have the Department of Administration and Information here with us. Patricia Bach, Director, please take it away. Good morning, uh, Chairman and Committee. Uh, my name is Patricia Bach, and I am the ANI Director. I have with me um, a little group today um, to discuss some of our updates and then leasing and some HR information. Um, sitting with me here is Dire uh, Deputy Director Russ Noel. Um, behind me, we have um, the GSD Administrator Andrew Coleman to talk about leasing. HRD Administrator Aaron Williams to talk about comp and all things comp and HR. Um, we also brought with us um, Jared Hansen, who is um, the program manager for Aaron, uh, under Aaron and the HRD. Um, similarly, we have Matt Simpson, um, the leasing coordinator, Nicole Brommer, who is also in leasing, and Jackie Knighton, who um, we have here today because she coordinated all the moves for the Thyra Thompson. Um, so we wanted to recognize her as well. So um, I'm here today to give you a little update on where we've been for the last year with a and uh, We've been pretty busy. So I wanted to go through a quick update. I don't think it'll take the whole half hour, but we'll do a quick update. Um, the first thing I wanted to talk about was the spring um, move to the Thyra Thompson. Um, we have nine agencies that went into that building um, 321 employees approximately, uh, took about six weeks. Um, we did it very smoothly. Um, so we had a lot of feedback saying that it actually went smoother than they thought it would go. Um, we have a lot of happy agencies up in Casper right now. Um, it's a beautiful building if you haven't had a chance to go up there and take a look at it. I encourage you to do that. There's some great, um, obviously some great uh, rooms for LSO as well to, to have their meetings. Um, <clears throat> so part of that move, um, although it went very smoothly, there were little hiccups budget-wise. And um, I wanted to talk a little bit about that. We, we had the ribbon cutting in April. We had dignitaries, Liz Cheney was up there, um, Senator Barrasso, uh, the governor, and, and multiple dignitaries. Um, we originally had talked about a contract to do custodial work and building maintenance. So we went out for RFP about a year prior. Um, those contracts came back two and three times more than anticipated. Um, so what we decided to do is take five positions from GSD down in Cheyenne, transfer them up to Casper, um, have our own custodial staff and our own building manager. Um, it cost roughly half of what it would for the for a contract. Um, on top of that, we have eyes and ears in the building, um, which I think is a little, um, which is a benefit. And um, we've had some feedback because we did have to have a because uh, a contract at the time. Uh, for a few weeks when it started. Um, we've had some comments saying that it's much better now that our staff is in there cleaning. Um, the contract was cleaning every other day, so it wasn't as um, thorough as what we have up there now. So we'll be working with the JAC to um, get those six positions back down to Cheyenne because we still need to have those positions. We just had to shuffle cards around when um, when the contract came in higher. So there's a couple budget issues 
kind of minor. We have our budget hearing tomorrow with the governor, so we'll go through those with the governor and then see what he thinks and then present it to the JAC. Uh, so I wanted to let you know that, that that was a change that we did. I think it's a change for the better. I think it's better to have state employees um, bless you, uh, on site so that we, we get a little more information. For example, there was an incident last week up there um, that was taken care of very quickly. Um, there was somebody who had made a threat, one of the um, agency DOC probation and parole. Um, the Casper police took care of it right away. It was a lockdown, nothing. He never made it to the building. And um, so I think that's a good example of how quickly things can get done when we have our own people on site. So um, we also have a supplemental for security. <laughs> Speaking of the, uh, the incident up there, they, there is security, I believe, on site, but we're trying to figure out um, how to get a, a global contract for all buildings. If you know, we have some security down here in Cheyenne as well. So we're working out to um, see if we can get a global contract for all the buildings, whether they're in Casper, Sheridan, or, or Cheyenne. So that's uh, Thyra Thompson. I don't know if you have any questions on Thyra Thompson. Anybody? Thank you for update. Any questions from the committee? Representative Brown. Thank you. So with the Thyra Thompson, do you guys have any other, um, you guys were able to move basically everybody in Casper into that one building now, is that correct? You guys, I'm seeing a no shaking behind you. So, right. um, <laughs> <laughs> so let me do it, just do the follow up. Um, what are our remaining agencies that are outside Thyra Thompson right now that are still up in Casper? Director, please. Thank you, um, Chairman, um, Representative Brown. There are a few agencies. Um, there is the, there is a military museum, um, and that's the only one at the top of the list I can see in my mind right now, but um, Andrew will be able to address that when he comes up, um, and, and I'm sure he has that information right at hand and would love to talk to you about that. There's not many, but there are a few. He said yes behind <laughs> All right, thank you. Please proceed. Um, no other questions from the committee on the Casper Thyra Thompson? Uh, I'll just say that uh, at least someone on the, thank you. Senator Boner, thank you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm uh, just wondering what our capacity is, uh, you know, with every, just about everybody that's gonna be moved in there, um, moved in, it seems like. Uh, how close are we to reaching that building's capacity um, in terms of, you know, if we ever move another agency up to Casper, I guess I'm wondering what the ability uh, for that may be someday. Director, please. Chairman Barlow, um, co-chair, uh, we are very close to capacity at Thyra Thompson, and that's one of the issues. We have 320, 321 uh, employees up there. Again, when um, Andrew comes up, he can talk a little bit further about the capacity of that issue, but it's very close. I don't think we would be able to put in another agency. We were struggling to find a place for our building manager. Um, so it's essentially full at this time. All right, so Ag Committee hold up on moving anybody up there. <laughs> All right. Any... Representative Stiver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, because there's rumors or there's uh, legislation out there to put at least two more state employees up there for uh, forensic psychologists or you're, you weren't in labor health. Uh, MDs, uh, autopsy people. Uh, are you going to have room for them if we that, that does go through? Uh, Director, if you're aware of that. Um, you can certainly respond to it. If you're not, then we'll have Clarence, Representative Stivar, get, visit with you offline about whatever that request is coming from. Chairman Barlow, Representative Stivar, um, I am not aware of that exact issue. I'm not sure that leasing is maybe aware, so that could be a question um, that I'll I'll talk with Andrew about as well. Two people are different than you know a, a 20 person agency. So um, there is always a chance we might find a corner here or a corner there. So um, that's something I can talk to you offline. Okay, thank you. Anything else? Um, so I, I, would, I would say that um, at least on behalf of what I've understood from speaking with our staff and who have been utilizing the building, that they are very appreciative of the support that they're getting and, the, um, and, uh, 
and the layout of the building um, for at least the legislative function. The rest of the building is your problem. We appreciate what you're doing for us. <laughs> um, but no, we do, it, it is very much appreciated. Um, and uh, I think it will become, is getting utilized very well now. And I think we'll only see more use of it. So thank you for that. Thank please, you very much, Chairman. Yeah, please proceed. So um, one of the, the second update I have for you is the capital information officer. I'm not sure if um, you're aware that across from the docents, um, we do have an A&I employee sitting there. Um, um, the director's office hired a senior office support specialist to oversee that area. Um, that position has been vacant since the renovation. So if you remember back in the day, um, there was somebody in the Herschler and somebody in, in the capital. Um, this person, it's a similar position um, with a little a few changes. Um, one, the person who went in there is the prior GSD administrator uh, who retired and decided that retirement wasn't for her and she still wanted to do something else. So Lori Gallus is over there and we're very happy to have her. She has a lot of knowledge of this building. Um, it is somebody who can work with LSO, uh, executive branch, um, and judicial when need be. So it's a, more of a coordinating piece and it seems to be working very well. So um, she is happy to work with the docents. She's um, also been tasked to go on the wayfinding uh, committee, which will be very helpful. So if you see her, um, again, it's Lori Gallus and she's been here for about two months and um, it's working out very well because she is our eyes and ears of some issues in the building that maybe we didn't know about. So. Um, so that's going very well. Uh, we're in the process of working with LSO to have an MOU in place, which is one of the things that was required. So um, I think we're all very happy on who we found for that position. So um, I think that's gonna be an easy task to get that MOU done so that we can all work together. Any questions on the capital information officer? Perfect, anything from the committee? Please proceed, thank you. Um, number three, COVID is still with us. Um, we still have outbreaks in the agencies and um, have to do some sweeping, not near as much as we were, um, but that is we're continuing to keep employees safe and um, constituents safe that come into the buildings um, during the pandemic. When we do have those cases, um, the safety officer and the custodial department work together to sanitize and disinfect, but it's certainly not as um, prevalent as it was in the last year and the year before. So hopefully we're coming out of that as well. Thank you. Um, Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Um, this is not really an a and initiative, however, um, Rob Krieger was tasked by the governor to run that program, and then um, they had chosen, rightfully so, Russ Noel to help with that. Um, so he's been working with Rob uh, to assist him in whatever he needs, working with the agencies. And I'm going to turn it over to Russ so that he can kind of give you a little bit of an update on where they are with IJA. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Russ Noel, Deputy Director with a and uh, members of the committee. There's not a lot to update. <laughs> Uh, we've been working through a number of uh, programs. We're currently tracking about 132 programs that I show. Some of those have dropped off, obviously. Um, and then we've had a number of those where it looks like they might start moving forward and then they things slow down. So the federal government, uh, we're waiting for rules, regs, other things to come out. We've got um, two or three things that, are, that look pretty good. Um, however, at this time, it's just been a slow process. I'd be happy to talk to anybody offline and get you more information. We did present about a 30-page report to the JC a couple weeks ago. I should say Rob presented that a couple weeks ago. Um, and I think that was kind of gave more of a detail of what, what it is and what these programs look like. So that's kind of the high level at this point. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Representative Gray. Can, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you provide a little more background on that? I, uh, so we're, the federal passed the federal government passed this. Uh, what 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 programs are, are out there? Uh, Mr. Please Chairman, proceed. Sure, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Gray. There there's actually a number of programs out there um, that we're looking at. Uh, we've got we've set up a number of teams from broadband, uh, cybersecurity, education, energy. 
uh, transportation, natural resources are several of the groups that we've got that we're looking at some of these. A lot of these um, grants are ones that we've had in the past, um, and they've just enhanced some of them. And then there's a few that are new that we're taking a look at. Like say at this time, it, it's just been a real slow process. So, so the summary that was presented at JAC would provide some of the details yeah, that Representative absolutely. Gray may be wanting. Absolutely, okay. I'd be happy to do that. Okay, thank you. I see uh, Senator Guru has his hand up. Thank Senator. you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yes, I was just going to mention that if you go to our JAC meeting minutes or detail, you'll see a full report. And to go back to the good representative's question, um, just today, um, I see on my list there's a B11 request for $25 million of that money for uh, capping orphan wells um, that the uh, Oil and Gas Commission submitted on, on that uh, from that from that program. So that's just came. I just got that about. An hour, less than an hour ago so it, it's going slow but it, it, that's the type of that's one of the types of programs it's listed thank you mr chairman thank you senator grew always good to have an appropriator keeping tabs on things <laughs> all right please proceed director or if there's no other questions on it i'll, I'll proceed through um our accounting office, um, at the request of the governor and the state budget department, um, I'm not sure if, if many know, but our, our accounting office does do accounting work for other agencies, smaller agencies. Um, and we were asked to accept additional responsibility for the gaming commissions, revenue tracking and reporting. Um, it comes from the biennial budget exception request that they made for additional personnel to perform the tasks and um, we were able to do that for them so they didn't need additional personnel. So we're working on that making sure that's um, taken care of in a timely manner and that they're happy. So um, the accounting office continues to cross train, especially with the addition of new agencies, um, providing continuity of performance in the absence of personnel. So when they don't have anybody, for example, the DA's office requested that we take over their accounting and we did. Um, so our accounting office is, is growing um, with requests. Um, it's nothing mandated. It, it's usually an agency saying we, we just don't have the people to do it and they come to our office and we take care of it for them. Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, just a question on that. Is that a situation in which, uh, and I'm sure we'll hear more from this from Ms. Williams here in a little bit, but is that a situation in which they're just not able to fill the positions and they're not able to get it taken care of? Or is this a position, a situation where, um, you know, they just don't have any applications coming in the door? What, what, it seems to me like a and is picking up a lot of, a lot of additional duties, um, but it does concern me at some point that there's going to have to be a, a, a level of which you guys cannot take on any more responsibility. Um, and so does that mean you guys are gonna just be looking to add on one or two people to take on that additional responsibility that they're not able to fill over here, but somehow magically you guys are gonna be able to fill? What does that look like? Director. Chairman Barlow, Representative Brown. Um, I don't think it's more, it, it's not a matter of being able to fill a position. Um, some of these agencies are two people agencies and they just don't have the expertise. So they don't need a, a full-time employee to do the work. So what we do is we look at what we can handle. Um, and it, if it gets to the, and I will say that it's probably at that, you know, getting to that point where um, if we add on much more, we would need to add another employee, which would still be less expensive than four agencies adding four people. Um, so that's what we're trying to do is to make sure that we are, um, as an, as the accounting department, not over, not um, overburdened but um, able to get the information done in a timely and, 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 and good manner um, without having to add additional personnel. Now, if it comes and we have an agency or two agencies that decide that they would like our help, we might have to reevaluate that. So we reevaluate that every time. So I don't think it's more of a, um, a recruitment issue as much as they just don't have the staff to do it. Representative Brown. Can you just shoot me an email with the level or the, the number of agencies that you guys have and maybe list them out by name, just so I have some understanding of 
what you guys are actually taking on as a responsibility. Please, Absolutely. thank you. I'm just, and, and on that note, it would also include all the boards and commissions that you also oversee as well that go through your accounting department. Chairman Barlow, uh, Representative Brown, I'll, I'll do that for everybody on the on the committee. We have 19 boards and commissions, um, and we do the accounting for them as as well. Um, so we'll get that information. I'll talk with Rory and have her do a little synopsis of of who we have. The, the Gaming Commission and the DA are the two that came on board recently. So um, um, just to be clear, Director, you said the DA meaning District Attorney. I'm sorry, yes, the district attorney. And so there's two district attorneys in the state of Wyoming. You're right. talking about the, the uh, Laramie County? Chairman, the Laramie okay. County only. Okay, yeah. thank you. Oh, um, and I can give you kind of a, a quick list right now. We do, um, the accounting office takes care of the governor's office, the residents, uh, state budget department, the licensing boards, environmental quality council, wildlife and national resource trust, um, and then the two that we added recently. But I will still give you an email uh, synopsis on that as well. Thank you very much. Please proceed. Thank you, Chairman. Um, next is EGI, Employees Group Insurance. Um, went out for a request for proposal for um, our administration, claims administration, disease management, pharmacy benefit management, and dental administration, along with life insurance coverage. Um, after reviewing the um, services and the, man the other management services and five pharmacy benefit manager bids, um, Cigna, again, was the health claims administrator that was chosen. Um, Delta Dental of Wyoming for um, dental claims and then standard insurance so that didn't change what did change was the pharmacy benefit um, we were able to um, contract with uh, a new pharmacy benefit manager and um, save approximately six million dollars um, because the formulary it was an open formulary if you know what that means so if i went to the pharmacy and my doctor prescribed some you know regular drug and it was open. So it was covered under our old benefit. Um, it was a good, it was a very open pharmacy plan and it was very expensive. Um, they were going to shut that down anyway. Um, so we had, when we went out for RFP, it is now a little more closed. Um, so there's been some changes that employees had to do if they were on one medicine, they had to see if their doctor could prescribe another one that was in our plan. If not, there was an appeal process and, and, and they were able to keep their old medicine. Um, so that was the biggest change for EGI. Um, on top of that, and, and spoke with JAC, um, we have looked at where we are um, with EGI with reserves and we are not going to raise rates this year. Um, so they're going to stay status quo. Um, the, Ralph Hayes, the pharmacist or the um, program manager, recommended no raise. Then I, what I do is I look at it with the um, the actuary and what his request is. I agreed with him and then put it up to the um, the governor to make a decision. And he included some folks, I believe, from the JAC, um, just to kind of let them know what we were doing. So that's where we are with the EGI, and so we won't be raising rates. So the the increases that folks got that you'll hear about. Um, will not be downgraded by a, a jump in EGI, so which is a good thing. Okay, thank you. President Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just being a past state employee, um, I remember a certain situation where a similar situation like this occurred where there was no increase in uh, premiums one year and then the next year it doubled. Um, yep. It was a zero to 12% increase at one point. Um, so is this a situation in which employees are not going to feel the pinch this year, but the employees next year are going to feel a larger pinch? Or is this a, we, we truly don't see the need for the increase? Director. Chairman Barlow, Representative Brown. Um, I understand that because I was here when that happened. Um, and in this case, um, approximately five years ago, um, EGI was in, in pretty good trouble. I think everybody knew that. Um, then COVID hit 
And what happened is people stopped going to the doctor. We ended up, and, and I hate to call it a windfall because it's not really a windfall, but most insurance companies um, in the country had a windfall from that because they didn't have claims that they were used to having. So we were in a very bad state four years ago, five years ago. Um, we are now in a very good position. Um, our reserve balance is very healthy. And um, in looking at what the actuaries are looking at, we still haven't seen that rebound from COVID. Um, when you look at it, I don't think anybody knows whether that rebound is gonna happen. I think we'll know by spring or summer if, there, if, somebody, if we decided that everybody decided to go back to the doctor. And the problem is you can't make up what you missed. So I'm not sure that that rebound is ever gonna be as high as, um, as some people think it is. So I am confident that not raising rates right now um, maybe next year we might have to have a 2% or something normal and get on that schedule that's a normal 2 to 3%. Um, so I am confident that unless something dramatic happens with the pandemic, that not raising rates this year is not going to be a double digit next year. Thank you. Um, what, is the, what are the number of covered lives right now in EGI, employee group insurance? Just, just a ballpark. Do you have it? The executive branch is about 40%, so it's 60% um, other, um, other employees, and the covered lives are 37,000 total members in the state benefit plan as of 2021. 17,000 are executive branch. Thank you. For the, any other questions, Director? Seeing none, none on the screen, please proceed. Chairman Barlow, um, next is the Wyoming State Library. I wanted to mention that the library reached a milestone anniversary on December 16th of um, last year, marking 150 years of providing library services to the state of Wyoming. Um, the library was also awarded $2 million in ARPA funds to support Wyoming libraries. Library directors and partners oversaw the creation of funding plan um, and Wyoming State Library will support state library infrastructure. So um, that was a, the milestone of 150 years is kind of surprising if you're, if you're not um, aware of the state library. And I, unfortunately, I think some people aren't aware of the state library. 150 years is a long time in Wyoming uh, for anything to continue going. So it was it was a good celebration and they did have a legislative reception for that as well. Um, and finally, on economic analysis, um, as most of you know, Dr. Liu works diligently on the Craig. Um, he worked um, that part of that division worked very closely with agencies on inflation factors, which was an issue this year. Um, it also worked with the Legislative Service Office, Wyoming Energy Authority. Um, they conducted a simulation with Remy model to estimate the economic, demographic, revenue, and expenditure impact of potential hydrogen production pro project. That was a pretty big um, initiative that they looked at as well. And that's essentially what happened in uh, this year besides leasing and um, all of the HR initiatives that have been happening. So. Um, if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to stand for questions. So any uh, questions for the director? We have two more updates, obviously, leasing and then the compensation one. So there may be topics, anything that's come up so far? Members of the committee online? All right, please proceed, director. All right, without any questions, I'll turn it over to the GSD administrator, Andrew Coleman, to discuss leasing and um, some of the updates that were requested for, for that department. Good morning, sir. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Andrew Coleman. I'm the administrator for the General Services Division. Um, I'm here to talk to you about leasing. Um, one quick thing, and it's not, I guess it's not related to leasing, but just um, I imagine you'll be curious. There is some uh, lay down of some uh, Car, or well, some 
plywood and, and protective uh, barrier for the grounds outside of the room here. Uh, we're doing an emergency major maintenance project, which I believe a notice was sent last week to the management council of there were two water line breaks we discovered over the summer in our hot water lines on this northwest corner of the Capitol between here and the connector. Uh, it took us a while to find them. We suddenly had an influx of water that was coming into our sump pump in the middle of the, of the connector um, at rather high temperatures. And uh, it took us a while to find out exactly where that might be coming from, if it was off property, if it was a water line break here. Um, after we identified that, we were able to work, um, stake instructions worked very hard on this to um, get a contractor in to come and do some work. We're gonna pull out, um, I think they will be pulling out some of the broken pipe, but replacing pipe over here underneath the, it's largely underneath the walkway into the northwest corner um, garden level entrance. And so they're uh, putting down some barrier for the contractor to be here for about two weeks so they can bring in the equipment and not damage the lawn or, or the sidewalk or anything like that. Um, so just in case you were curious what was going on outside. Thank you. Um, the first area I wanted to talk to you about since we've got some questions was about the Thyra Thompson building. Um, the uh, moves from the into the Thyra Thompson building, and we had one agency at that same time decide they did not need a lease. It was a one person office. Um, but basically the moves in Casper resulted in a reduction in square footage and our costs of about 90% up in Casper. So we have five remaining leases uh, there is a storage lease for the military department, so it's not the actual military museum, but there is some extra storage of the other exhibits that they have that we maintain a lease for. There is a uh, parking and an office lease um, for the DCI um, office up in Casper. That, that did not move in the AG's office's attorney's office, uh, their law office, did move into the Thyra Thompson building, but their DCI office has remained off campus. Um, which was part of the plan when they programmed the building. The Paramutual Commission also has an office that's in a lease up there off site. And then we also have a uh, Department of Health office. And I think that's a WIC program office. Yeah, it's a WIC program office. Um, so those were those are what we're left with. And it's about 10% of the, of the footprint that we had before. Um, there were uh, all of the leases that we did move into or almost all the leases were able to be terminated two months early um, ahead of the move, which because of the way our, our um, payments are generally either once a year or twice a year, um, a couple of ones in Cheyenne, I think maybe quarterly, but mostly once or twice a year, we had to prepay for those two months. And so our leasing department has been working over the summer to get uh, refunds for those two uh, months of overpaid um, rent. And so far we've recovered $100,941 out of uh, 147,000, we believe is, is um, Owen doing, and we've been working well with the landowners to get that, that money back to the state. Um, as far as the questions uh, that were raised earlier about the capacity of the building, um, the building is, is currently built out for basically to, cap, to basically to capacity. So there isn't any extra space out there for like a new office suite or anything like that. Um, there are if there are offices or, or workspaces that are vacant, my understanding is those are generally vacancies within the agency they're assigned to and are not really permanently or undeveloped space or permanently vacant space. The Chancery Court is in the process of setting up their, I think, their IT and moving up some of the furniture and things they will need to begin holding hearings up there in the near future. Um, they are still under a, um, they're still under a temporary uh, judge situation where they've got, I think, a panel of three judges, district court judges who are handling the docket for the Chancery Court. Um, they are still, I believe, planning to have a full-time staff, including a judge and court reporter and, and um, legal assistants and that, that full contingent they would have. Um, but I believe that's still around two years out. Uh, and, and some of the members of the committee here may be more in the know on that through judiciary or, or otherwise more advised by the judicial branch. But our understanding is they're not planning to have the permanent staff in there for um, maybe a couple of years, but they will be using it um, as soon as they have the courtroom filled it out for hearings when they need it up in Casper. And they'll have those visiting uh, court staff. There is a director for the Chancery Court, as you, I'm sure you're aware, that's down here currently at the um, Supreme Court offices. I don't know of a timeline where they would be looking to try to move a person up there. But the space is already built out, it looks very nice. Um, and they are going to start conducting court hearings in there. Um, I 
believe sometime this fall or winter. Um, were there any Thank other you. questions as far as the vacancies? Oh, I guess I will say I'm not aware of any proposed legislation at, um, that may be trying to add positions up in Casper. So I would look forward to any information that you would want to let us know about on, on those. Um, Representative Starvarf. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's five positions for a forensic psychologist, uh, autopsy, two autopsy technicians, and one administration specialist. So, Representative Stavar, what, what, this who, is where is this coming from? This there? is coming from the Labor Health. Okay, thank you. So, apparently, you need to start attending Labor Health meetings now. I will put them down the calendar, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> and that's next. Uh, thank you. The 6th and 7th, October. All right, thank you. All right, anything, any questions so far? More on the Thyra Thompson building. All right, please continue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, that was what I had to uh, discuss on Thyra Thompson, so I will go ahead and move on to our next topic. Um, uh, the committee had asked for an update on the 2020 carry litigation. Um, this was for uh, a office building that we rented out most of the space during the Capitol Square project. Um, there was some litigation that resulted from uh, that lease. There was a settlement on that, and I can report to you that um, haven't heard any issue since, so I believe the case is completely done. It was settled back in February of 2020. Um, it's largely a case that really didn't involve a and uh, The lease was part of the Capitol Square project, and so the state construction, I think, was more involved, um, or the, and the folks that worked on the Capitol Square project were primarily involved in setting up the lease, as well as when it turned into litigation, the AG's office did an excellent job of, of resolving that. So a and actually did not have a lot of uh, involvement with it, but I can let you know, based on the, the documents that were filed with the court, um, that the claims were all settled. It was uh, February of 2020 when the settlement was filed, and the uh, the cost to the state to settle it was $275,238, um, and that was a, a agreed payment that that released all the claims. And since that uh, that was filed, um, we have not heard any issues. So I believe that's completely done deal. Thank you. Please proceed. All right. um, the last um, item I wanted to uh, discuss with you all had to do with escalation clauses, and this was from another set of questions we had at the last meeting. Um, a and I, we have around 160 to 170 um, leases that we pay. Um, so those are, I guess, payable where the state is renting space from a private, from another entity. Um, 37 of those have escalation um, built into the pay tables. So generally what we'll do is we'll structure the lease so that it says for this payment, it's this amount, this payment, it's this amount. And over time, that's, that's what we mean when we say escalations built into it, that future payments will increase. Uh, generally, the escalations range from 1.37% up to 5%. Um, usually those are annual, but there are quite a few that are actually just every other year. Um, and the average escalation of all of those is 1.79%. Um, so it's a minority of our, our leases at only 37 out of 160. Um, but that's kind of, that's uh, sort of where it lines up. Um, we work very hard to uh, negotiate with landowners to make sure that we have a fair amount. And um, it kind of depends a little bit on the circumstances of the office, the circumstances of the community. Um, and that's that's kind of the general uh, if, information on that. I'll if you check. could, um, what's the average term of these leases? Talking about the average escalator, et cetera. What's the average term? Two, ten, twenty? Um, I I, just a ballpark. I just four to five years. Yes, Thank Mr. You. Chairman. Yeah, Thank four you. to five years. Um, Thank you. Uh, one thing I did want to mention as far as escalators is that in the past, and I don't, I guess I don't know how old those leases would have been, um, there were uh, leases where landowners asked for something along, uh, something that was adjusted to like a cost of living index or some sort of an index. Um, we've gone away from that because you can't predict them for budgetary purposes. And we needed to make sure we have more reliable numbers um, when we're setting up our budget. And uh, so we have, uh, believe, eliminated all or if not all, um, you know, there's one left, um, our staff is telling me. So 
Uh, we have one left of, the, uh, of that type of a lease. Otherwise, the escalators are fixed numbers. Thank you. Questions? Representative Brown. I, just to, I, I actually not a question, but your guys' bench is awesome. <laughs> you, I really appreciate you guys having the, the figures on this. Um, this. This really did stem from the Sutherland's building and, and really going in deep into that um, and some frustrations I certainly and as well as plenty of other legislators had with that particular one. So I do have a slight question that four to five year lease um, average I'm guessing that's without having that Sutherland's lease in there. That's a 20 plus year lease. Is that right? Okay. I'm, I'm getting from the bench again, some shaking heads. So I Go just ahead. want to make sure that we're not skewing that number dramatically because of having one extremely long lease in there. So. Go ahead, Mr. Coleman. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Representative Brown. Yes, um, that is an outlier. Um, there are a couple of odd leases we have that are very long like that, but I think I'm talking like two to three, and one of them is a very weird lease that we've had since the 80s for a piece of property that we lease, um, a livestock board piece of property. So yeah, the four to five is the vast majority. That's, um, yeah. Thank you. Further questions? Please proceed. Um, well, Mr. Chairman, that is um, all of the items um, I wanted to make sure to talk to you all about. Uh, if there are any questions you have, um, I guess I'd open up for that. I think you're off the hook. I don't see any, any hands raised or anything on the, online. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to come and update you. All right, where are we at to now, Director? Chairman Barlow, I would have Aaron Williams come up um, to discuss the state recruitment retention and compensation update. That is uh, great. Welcome, Aaron. And I think we have Ms. Reed who is wanting to come on. Is that one of your agency folks? Do we know? This is a member of the public. Okay, so we'll, we'll let her in, we'll take public. Is there any public comment or anything we've had so far? I should do that before we go. Is there anybody else online? Okay, thank you. And no Chairman, Joanne Reed is the head of the um, Professional Licensing Board with a and so she might have anticipated I don't know that listening. it's Joanne. I don't know that it's Joanne that's on the request of the access. Right. Okay, all right, thank you. So it's not Joanne, it's oh, someone else, so we'll get to them during, um, during, thank you, during uh, public comment. So please, Aaron, welcome. Chairman Barlow, members of the committee, thank you for having us this morning. We were asked to come back and give an update to you all on the human resource consolidation, as well as the last implementation of the market merit matrix increases. HRD has completed phase one of HR centralization. We have the positions and budgets have been now moved into ANI standard budget, so most of the positions and funding have been converted to general fund. We still do have a small group of positions that are funded by general funds, but our accounting office is working with those agencies. We did not want to find ourselves in the situation um, where ETS was, where we had multiple funding sources and we were doing direct billing, so we're still working on cleaning that up, but we're, we're almost there with that. We have now transitioned into phase two of HR consolidation. We've implemented our new position structure. Um, positions have been reallocated. Staff have received new duties. Um, the reason for that was to improve our HR staffing ratio, as well as ensuring the consistent composition that every agency have a similar size staff and structure meeting their needs. Um, we also wanted to have continuous service without any service interruptions. We have grouped our agency HR structure to include, there's seven different groups of HR staff that we have. We have a capital complex groups that serves a total of eight agencies. We have the military department in Game and Fish who are serviced by a, a staff, a team there. Department of Transportation, Department of Health. We have combined three agencies, Department of Family Services, Workforce Services, and Oil and Gas into one team that oversees the HR. The reasoning for some of these groupings is we wanted to not only have HR staff mainly located here in Cheyenne, but we now have teams up in Casper and, and around the state so that we can meet the needs of our field state employees as well. Department of Corrections has a team. And that here in ANI, um, similar to what Director Bach had mentioned with the general services 
and some of the teams that we have here in our accounting, um, our ANI team supports a total of 39 additional smaller agencies. So we did an assessment at the beginning, and like Director Bach said, some of the smaller agencies had positions that maybe did small amounts of HR, admin assistant work, or fiscal. We have absorbed those duties, and our HR team is performing the HR for those agencies. Um, since July, we have worked on um, reallocating our positions, making sure that our team is paid equitably, and that they're all classified appropriately for the new duties that they have taken on. Um, we have been reallocated positions like we talked about to streamline our processes. So we had agencies um, performing employment verification. So lenders across the state were having to call the ANI office or try to figure out what agency these employees worked out and it was a very cumbersome process. We now have one team that does that for the entire state. We have one team that reviews and approves and verifies all payroll transactions statewide. And that's a team that's under Jared Hansen that we have with us today. Um, we have regular staff meetings with all 60 HR staff so that we're all on the same page and doing, doing the same things, um, making sure that operational standards across agencies have been implemented, improving the consistency so that onboarding in, with our employees is consistent across the state, um, as well as the compliance and transparency aspect of, of what's going on in our agencies. On the technology side, um, we have completed multiple bid efforts. Um, the statewide employee assistance program used to be with five agencies, five of the largest agencies had a contract. We've been able to renew that at a significantly lower monthly cost and all state employees and all agencies are now covered under that. We also have implemented a master service agreement with um, several, or several vendors to provide drug and alcohol treatment services, and that's also an enterprise effort instead of agency by agency. The final thing that Jared's team is, is embarking upon is uh, many years ago, we implemented a performance management system and a recruiting system. We had two different vendors that we were working with. We recently went through a bidding process, and we are now transitioning performance management up under NeoGov which was our recruiting system. So now our HR system, performance and recruiting will all be with one system. We were able to do that with the existing funds that HRD has always had. However, I will caveat that with the increase in technology and some of those contracts, we do anticipate in the future that that's gonna catch up to us and you may see us back asking for little systems with that enterprise as, as those contracts increase. Um, that's that's kind of our update. We did want to let you guys know we will be returning initially with our first phase of savings, five positions and approximately $800,000. We will have another phase of positions, but as we had talked about originally, we wanted to do this through attrition without riffing any employees, and so we're still continuing on that, but we anticipate we'll have more positions in the future as well. We also um, have vacancy savings that HRD has reverted of 1.3 million. Um, so it's a, a little over 2 million that with the initial HR consolidation that we've been able to return to the state. Thank you. Please, Rep Senator James, question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I was contacted recently by some uh, long-term care facility directors about uh, some state facilities that are directly competing with private sector as far as wages. The state facilities are paying CNAs, uh, LPNs, and um, other employees much higher wages. They're paying their CNAs at rates $45 an hour, LPNs $75 an hour. RNs and other nurses, 100 plus dollars an hour. Private facilities can't compete with these wages. I was just curious, do you guys have any involvement in these uh, wages or is this Department of Health that are coming up with these wages? Thank you. Please proceed. Chairman Barlow, Senator James, you know, I'm not familiar with those salaries. I'd have to look to double check. We definitely are involved in the hiring 
of state employee classified positions and that they would have to fall within our pay tables. Um, anything above that would have to come through us through an exception request. However, you know, Department of Health also has some independent service contracts that they have to run due to st some staffing issues. So I think we'd have to talk and see if these are classified employees or, or some of their contracts, because at this time I'm, I'm not sure. Yes, yeah, so there's probably more details to be gained than we're gonna get through here. Senator James. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And from it sounds of it, sounds like they might be AWAC because um, they go for nine months, then give them three months off, then come back for nine months, three months off type scenario or a one month off and then bring them back. Uh, but either way, they're stealing them from the long term care facilities and they're in danger of shutting down because they take away vital employees like uh, director of nursing. They can't operate without those employees. And I know the state facilities, they can't handle all the, um, the patients that if the private sector were to shut down, they can't handle <laughs> all the patients. So um, that needs to be addressed if it's within your realm. Um, so thank you. All right, thank you. I think there's more to be learned there about what type of employees, where the facilities are, and what type of care is being. Uh, Representative Stiver, question? Uh, just on the note, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator uh, James, but it sounds like these are the traveling nurses and CNAs and stuff that they have. So there's more to learn here. I don't know that we, we're not going to answer those questions today with the folks we have before us. So um, I do appreciate it. Representative Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to ask a little bit about HR consolidation. You know, I've been pretty passionate about this, and um, you know, glad to hear that that the plan is to, you know, effectuate a reduction. I my intent was always to have it through attrition as well. I'm just curious what that looks like. Five positions through attrition. I mean, what's the timeline, and how do you go to JAC to get the positions sort of classified? I mean, uh, do you have a timeline on that, or is it just kind of as it happens? You kind of uh, it plays out. Please proceed. Chairman Barlow, um, Representative Gray, you know, the timing on that, the five positions we already have, so those will be coming back this legislative session with the 800,000. We've been shuffling positions around. We've had some promotional opportunities, and so it's kind of been a game of dominoes for us. Um, with the HR consolidation, one of our existing employees may take on a promotional position in another agency, and then when that position becomes vacant, we're capturing capturing another position and, and keeping that empty. So, you know, the timeline on that, we're looking at the next two to three years, we should be able to have some additional positions for you. Thank you. Follow up, President Gray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to make sure I'm, I have to rewatch that. I make sure I understand everything that was just said there. But from 30,000 feet up, the plan is to effectuate a five position reduction in the from the HR via, you know, if you added up all the different agencies two or three years ago, everything was centralized and the plan is through retirements attrition to affect to have five less positions in the HR sphere. Or did I misunderstand that? Please proceed, Go ahead. proceed director. Chairman Barlow, uh, Representative Gray, the five positions are currently being given back now. We anticipate more positions. So the 30, to kind of use your terminology, the 30,000 foot view is probably to have something more along the lines of 10 positions back, um, more or less. And so um, I would also say that the majority of the positions were higher level positions as well. So they were supervisory positions. That's why it's $800,000 for the five positions that we're giving back this January or February. All right, thank you. Any further further discussion or comments, Representative or Senator James? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just curious if you might be able to uh, expand a little bit on performance management and what you were referring to on that, please. please Chairman proceed. Barlow, Senator James, I'm going to turn that over to Jared Hansen, our program manager. He's the one actively working on um, transitioning the halogen system over to the NeoGo. Please proceed, Mr. Hansen. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator James, uh, excuse me, Jared Hansen, Program Manager with Human Resources Division. 
Uh, it's a it's a great question, and 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 in case you didn't don't recall, or, or I don't know if we've shared this with the committee before or not, but what we have um, outside of HRD's walls is what we refer to as a PMI continuous improvement group, and that group is consists of you know not only uh, human resource professionals within HRD now, but we have professionals and, and representatives from outside HRD that that from other agencies, supervisors, directors, administrators, a full variety or, or gamut of of different types of personnel that sit on this committee. Uh, who have who have just recently underwent a an evaluation process of our performance management program. Um, so knowing that we're shifting gears from um, one system to NeoGov, we will need to make sure that the program currently still meets the needs of of, of the state. Um, so we're currently undergoing a review of that program. Uh, we've outlined some criteria and, and some basic foundations uh, and, and needs that have to be met. A lot of those are statutory requirements, uh, such as having a robust system, uh, such as in, um, having a, 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 a policy or, or rules in place that manage this program. Some of those things are things like ensuring employees are evaluated by an appropriate supervisor, someone who has at least 90 days of supervision before they're able to, prov to provide an evaluation on a, a current employee. Uh, so we're flushing through all the details of that. Uh, and as we embark and, and start to have conversations with our new vendor uh, in NeoGov, you know, we're, I don't know yet what the system's gonna look like, uh, but we need to make sure that our policies, our, our rules, the program itself still, still support the need uh, of the state. So that's what we're currently undergoing right now with this PMI continuous improvement group. So I just want to clarify, you're actually changing systems, not you're continuing the, the effort, but it's a change of programs or systems. Is that accurate? Mr. Chairman, that is correct. Okay, thank you. Follow up, Representative Senator James. Thank you. So what was wrong with the old system? <laughs> Please Mr. proceed. Chairman, Senator James, I, you know, I think that this HR consolidation was an opportunity for us to look at the systems to see if there was some potential savings uh, that could be realized. Um, I don't know that the system had um, was a problem. Um, we had a lot of feedback, you know, through employees over the course of the year in this PMI continuous improvement group. Why we did, why we saw the need for that, um, ensuring that the program was still good. But the system itself, uh, what we used previously, I think, was did function properly. Um, it. We just saw this as an opportunity as we went through these RFP efforts as an opportunity to consolidate systems and potentially have one system that could that could meet both their needs in terms of recruitment and performance management. So we hope that that streamlines some processes and makes it a little bit easier for supervisors and employees uh, being accustomed with the look and feel of one system opposed to multiple systems. Chairman Barla, uh, sorry, Please proceed. I also wanted to note that it is less expensive as well. Um, when we did the RFP, the current provider was going to be significantly more expensive. Um, so we went the less expensive route and to consolidate into one. Um, hopefully that makes it easier for everybody to use. And Chairman Barlow, Senator James, I think Please. the existing system that we were with was also going to transition us onto a new platform. So we would be moving anyway. So we wanted to evaluate the most cost effective. Um, we were actually able for what we were paying for both systems before, we were able to continue on with what we were doing in the past, but also to enhance what we were doing with this new platform. We'll have an onboarding module that'll help us with our HR consolidation and the consistency. There'll be some new functionality in the recruiting system, so we'll have more interaction with our applicants. And so we were actually able to do more um, for, a, for a less you know, inexpensive process than we were running before. Thank you. Senator James. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And what uh, what's your estimated cost savings? Please proceed, Mr. Chairman, Senator James. We can get those to you. I mean, the, like as as Administrator Williams just shared, I think we were able to underneath this umbrella of uh, of what we were paying before with the two separate systems. We were able to enhance a lot of the services that we were able to receive through this one vendor. Um, so we're still in the process of developing, you know, what those additional modules are going to look like and what benefit they can provide to the state. You know, uh, Administrator Williams mentioned the onboarding. You know, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about recruitment retention. One of the additional modules that they're going to provide to us is, is a tool that's called a track. It's a pretty cool thing where it'll allow HR to proactively source candidates. Uh, and that's something that I think the state is really, um, you know, our recruitment strategy in the past has, has been a little bit different. We've been able to rely on people just knowing, being aware of the state and applying for the jobs. 
And now that um, competition has just become a little bit more competitive, uh, you know, we're, we're struggling to, uh, to, to gain the um, attention of some of those potential applicants. So I think that this attract tool will help us hopefully garner and increase our candidate pool and our applicant pool. So hopefully we can uh, see some improvement there, but I can certainly get those numbers for you so you, so you have all that detail. Okay. Senator James. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Do you know when? Yeah, we have the we have the details of the um, the, the contract uh, already executed and signed, so that would be no problem to get it to you right away. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Anything further? Please proceed, Director or Aaron. Chairman Barlow, um, with the consolidation, that's that's all the update we had on the consolidation. But with that, I'll go straight into the implementation of the market merit increases. HRD worked collaboratively um, with the governor's office and the Wyoming legislature to implement statewide compensation adjustments that were effective in July. Um, we produced multiple documents, um, one totaling over 150 pages outlining our initial concerns and what we were hoping to accomplish. Um, these efforts resulted in 64.8 million compensation package. Um, of that, the executive branch agencies received over 37 million to implement our market merit matrix. This adjusted our pay tables to the 2020 market and provided pay adjustments for over 7,000 executive branch state employees. And salaries on average moved nearly 8% from their prior rate. So that was the average increase of our state employees. Um, as you recall, our phase one um, was adjust as close to market of the 2020 pay tables as we could. And that was, we were able to accomplish that um, with these past increases. Um, that phase one went in two steps. So we initially moved all state employees who were not at the minimum of those new pay tables. And then the step two was um, move through the market merit matrix based on a combination of how far away you were from market um, compared to your performance. Phase two um, is in the process now. We are working on recommendations for the next go round. We had mentioned that since we were so far behind operating on the 2017 pay tables, it was gonna take us a couple reiterations of, of what we just completed in July to get state employees caught up. We do have some initial data showing that if we were to move to the 2021 market data, the estimated cost per year to get employees to the market policy position, and this is just base pay only, would be about $60.5 million additional, additional to get to the 2021 market data. So even though we made a lot of progress um, with our July increases, we're still pretty far behind on our market data. We also will be receiving 2022 market data and um, that should be available and we should have the numbers in November. Yes, Representative Brown, question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just to make sure I understand completely 100% uh, clear here, we have everybody up to at least the 2020 pay tables now, is that right? We have Please them at proceed. least. <laughs> Chairman Barlow, um, Representative Brown, we have everybody on the 2020 pay tables. However, they're centered at the bottom of the pay table. So we are not at the market policy position. That's our ultimate goal. But we do have everyone at least to the entry of the new 2020 pay tables. That was phase one. Is that accurate? Aaron? Correct. Yes, phase one. Questions from the committee? Questions? Please proceed. If that's the end. Yeah. Chairman Barlow, you know, we, we've had a lot of conversations about the whole effort that we're trying to, the problem that we're trying to solve is the recruiting and retention issues that we're experiencing in the state of Wyoming. And I think at this point with implementation in July, it's a little too soon to see what effect this has had. Anecdotally, we've heard from agencies that they were able to retain quite a few employees who were looking at leaving, knowing that the state is looking into their salaries and they did receive that increase. We have, um, at the end of June, we, re, um, we completed our workforce report. It is out on our website, so it has our new updated turnover information out there. It is pretty alarming. Um, on page 52, if you look at our 10-year history total turnover for fiscal year 21 and 22, um, and this is including transfers, we're sitting at 24.8% turnover as June 30th. 
Um, without transfers, people have, who have chose to leave the state of Wyoming entirely, it's 22.8%. So we have a long ways to go in our recruiting and retention efforts. Jared, Director Bach and I sit on a jobs workforce committee. Um, most agency directors are on there. The governor's office has representatives. So we're continually working with our agencies on, on what we can do specifically with them. Um, each agency is individual and kind of unique in how we need to address their recruiting and retention efforts. And as we know, salary is only one component of that. Agencies are getting creative, you know, offering jeans days or trying to implement technology breaks and, and different things like that. Um, we're, you know, working on expanding our employee assistance programs, making sure our state employees know that there's wellness programs available for them. And so we're, we're working on a couple different committees to see what we need to do. You know, as Jared noted, onboarding, um, it's, it's really important to onboard our employees, but we find with our turnover, we lose state employees within that first zero to five years. So we're going to implement some stay interviews instead of exit interviews. It, it's always great to know why our employees are leaving, but we need to talk to those who are staying and figure out what's working for them and what we need to do more of, or those employees who are thinking of leaving, what do we need to do in order for them to stay? So, so those are some future initiatives that HRD is, is working on to try to see what we can do to, to slow down this turnover. Okay, thank you very much. Rep. Sam uh, Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I, I wanna go back just quickly here. You had mentioned that if we move to the 2021 pay tables, it's a $60.5 million adjustment, um, roughly equivalent to what we just did. Does that bring everybody to MPP or is that bringing everybody up from 2020 at the base to 2021 at the base? What does that 60.5 million get us? Please proceed. Please Chairman proceed. Barlow, Representative Brown, that would get everyone to the market policy position, the MPP. Of 2021? Of 2021. Thank you. Further questions? Further questions? Anything else, Director? Aaron, Aaron, please. Chairman Barlow, I know that somebody in the last meeting had also had a question about the DOC, Department of Corrections turnover. As is the case with the Department of Corrections, they're, they're still experiencing quite a bit of turnover. We met with Director Shannon last week. Um, the Human Resources Division and the Budget Department are working with them to see what we can effectively help them with now. They had come in with an ask to move their correctional officers to the market policy position and we've decided to wait on that until the enterprise ask and handle it you know with the request that we have for all of the other agencies but we are working with the governor's office and the budget division to see if we can help doc do something in the meantime and until we, we get through this phase two process okay thank you are there are there other agencies that seem to be having a particular difficulty just name them if you don't mind. Yeah, Chairman Barlow, I, you know, there's, I think every agency is experiencing issues, maybe not in all their occupational groups, but there's some occupational families we're really struggling with. Correctional officers being a few of them, custodians in a and I, we're having quite a bit of an issue concern with DOT with the snowplow drivers. And so there's pockets of, of classifications that we're working on um, where there's really urgent needs. And then with our enterprise asks, hopefully those will help the, the remaining agencies because I think every agency is struggling for recruiting at this point. Thank you. All right. Senator James. Senator oh, Senator Boner, sorry. Senator Boner on the screen. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think we're all aware of um, uh, the Wyoming Military Department shutting down the Cowboy Challenge Academy due to uh, personnel concerns. And so I, I'm glad to hear that, say, Department of Corrections is being proactive and making sure they don't have a similar situation. I'm just wondering if the military department reached out to a &I to try to, uh, what they did, if anything, to try to get ahead of these apparent concerns, which uh, um, uh, escalated very quickly in, in, in a surprising manner. So just wondering uh, if you had any discussions regarding the Cowboy Challenge Academy with the military department. Please proceed, Aaron. Chairman Barlow, Co-Chair Boner, yes, the military department has reached out to us. Um, we are working very collaboratively with them. We have a team that's working with the military department, three HR representatives, and two um, Department of Workforce Services employees have been a team that have been regularly up there meeting with employees and, and assisting them through this transition. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Chair. Please. Uh, yeah, just a little bit more detail, I guess, as to what 
those discussions have been like. It's uh, obviously it's a concern when we have a successful program that's been administered for 15 plus years and all of a sudden they, they can't administer it. Uh, just a little bit more discussion as to the uh, the discussion around the uh, challenge with uh, retaining their employees there in Guernsey. Please proceed, Director. I think maybe this is a, probably a question for the military department, some of this question, but if you have any insight, that would be appreciated. Chairman Barlow, Co-Chair Boner, um, I, I, we have had discussions with um, the, the TAG, and um, as Aaron said, we have teams up there. I will say that we try very, very hard when it comes to a RIF, and essentially that's what this is. It's riffing the entire Guernsey um, uh, facility to see if some of the folks are willing to go to DOC. Um, sometimes that's a norm, that could be a transition. Um, so we're talking to them about that. We're talking to them about going to different agencies. So um, that's essentially the, the beginning stages of what we're talking about. My understanding is that the December 31st, I think, is what they're looking at for um, the the end of the employment of those folks so that sounds like a long way away it's very it, it's going to come up very quickly so we are working diligently to see if we can place these folks in other other facilities other agencies if they're willing to move um, guernsey is a difficult place to um, get good quality employment uh, for the um, for the facility, a lot came from Douglas, a uh, couple from Wheatland, some from Cheyenne. So they are in those areas that they might have the ability to go to a different agency. And that's what we're trying to facilitate now. Thank you. So to be clear, I think for Senator Boner and maybe a follow-up question from Representative Stivars, we're actually not talking about how we could have salvaged or the changes that could have been made to um, retain the program. We're talking about the aftermath of how, trying to help these state employees transition or have a transition within um, state government. So that's sure. what your role is. There's questions about the program and the challenges the program had. That's probably something for another department on another day. Representative Chairman Stiver. Barlow, absolutely. Thank you, Representative Stiver, on, on the transition of employees. My question is, prior to the transition, like the Department of Corrections now is working with you to get more did the, did the military department work with you prior to this to get more employees up there? Director Bob. Chairman Barlow, I would say that um, on the first question, like DOC, um, we've, we've known the issues with DOC for years. Um, so we have been working with DOC for years. Anytime an agency calls us, we do everything we can to help them um, through retention and um, <clears throat> recruitment. And it's been difficult um, up in Guernsey. It has always been difficult. It's very similar to the problems they have in Rollins with DOC. So we have been working off and on with them throughout the years for recruitment. Okay, thank you. All right, anything further? That's all we have, sir. That's all you have. Well, That's thank you very have. much for all your work. <laughs> thank you for uh, the updates. Do you have, yeah, and so I want to be clear, I think we're going to have at least one more meeting for sure because we have an audit report this too. Do you have any requests from this committee for bill sponsorship for any um, statutory changes or authorities or anything that you might like to consider? Because I would like to have them known at this committee meeting so that we can consider them and then have a bill request for our subsequent meeting. So do you have anything that's come across your desk, Director Bach, that you think we would you would you would like sponsorship for? Chairman the, Barlow, at this time I don't. Um, however, it might be something um, in the next few weeks I might want to talk offline um, just to kind of run something by you. Um, and I don't have anything right now that would require statute change. Senator Grew, thank you. Senator Grew. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick comment um, to thank the director. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, this committee um, really put a highlight, shined a light on the um, leasing program. And um, I think that the, that the director and the department really took that to heart. And I think that it's moving in a very positive direction. If we remember the 
problems we had with the EGI and some of the issues that we had with that. I, the number 102 million is sitting in my head somewhere about that that's about what we're sitting along on right now in, a, in that uh, EGI program, probably more than the federal government wants us to have. And I know that's a bit of a struggle, but uh, the department's really, really put the shoulder to the wheel and tried to do the best for the employees. And, and to Senator Representative Brown's question, um, I, I would be very surprised if we came back with a with a hard hit next year on that. I think that they're really watching that close. But the bottom line is, is that every time we set one up for um, a and I to take on, they've been, they've answered the call. And now with this, uh, I know that $60.5 million number on the, on the pay scale is gonna be a big lift and a difficult push for the, for the body, I know. But uh, as the department knows, I've been after him a bit on and talking about more of a global thing about wellness programs and that. And it sounds like once again, they're taking that to heart. So I just wanted to kind of tell them how much I appreciate the fact that they do. I think they're listening to this committee and they're listening to some other committees that uh, I see it, uh, come before me anyway. And, and I appreciate it. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, we're glad you appreciate we listen to you or someone listens to you, Senator. <laughs> Very few, very few. But they are one of the small group. <laughs> thank you thank very you. much. I guess we have another oh. one more thing, Representative Brown. Just a quick thank you to you guys. I know, and especially to Jackie sitting back there, um, as I was part of the, the move and the transition in and out of that building over there downtown, um, you guys have an amazing uh, cat herder, if you will. Um, <laughs> she's absolutely fantastic. And um, seeing what she was able to accomplish and the amount of um, pride that she takes in her job and what you guys were able to accomplish up there with Ira Thompson. So thank you guys very much for all the work you guys do. Chairman Barlow, Representative Brown, thank you very much. I know Jackie thanks you. I know if we didn't have her uh, for Herschler and Thyra Thompson, it would have been a disaster. So um, I thank her as well. She's an integral part of the team and <clears throat> she gets stuff done, as they say. So thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Please keep us informed if there is something that you think you need um, as far as a statutory approach to anything. Um, so ETS, you're going to be up next, but we're just going to take a 10 minute break. So it's we'll start again at 1030. And um, for ETS director, I see deputy director, there he is. All right. Um, you're going to get the same question at the end of the at your presentation. If there's something you need out of this committee as far as statutory changes, you got to let us know. So 10 minute break and we'll reconvene. Oh, actually, no, wait a minute. We have somebody still online. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, if the individual who wanted to make a testimony comes back on. Thank you. We'll break for 10 minutes.
I'll get a green light, thumbs up. We're good? I got the not, head nod. All right, welcome back. Um, just after 10.30, we're pleased to be joined by Director Vida and our ETS department, Deputy Director. Please proceed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, my name is Bill Vida. Uh, I serve as the Director of the Enterprise Technology Services and as the state's Chief Information Officer. I have here at the DIAS with me this morning, Mr. Tim Sheehan, who serves as our Deputy Director and our Deputy CIO. And uh, thank you for your time this morning. Uh, I'd like to start out really kind of providing a little bit of context since last time we were here before you. This is my second time uh, before the committee. Uh, in the last three months or so, we've traveled about 6,400 miles. Uh, I continue to spend time uh, not only uh, for myself, but for the, the phase one face of the department, uh, kicking the tires, so to speak. Uh, there was a lot of uh, time uh, during the interim and even before uh, where we didn't have an opportunity to get out and see firsthand as a leadership team exactly uh, what business functions and missions we were supporting. And so we went and visited places like the Skilled Nursing Center in Buffalo, uh, the State Hospital in Evanston. Uh, we visited the Boys and Girls School. And I understand I'm the first CIO who's actually spent time in all the prisons here in Wyoming. Uh, so we're getting a good sense of what the infrastructure... Visit, visiting the prisons. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Consulting. <laughs> Thank you for catching that, sir. <laughs> uh, so we've been getting out, taking a look at the infrastructure, uh, seeing what kind of missions our folks support and uh, what we're asking them to do every day. Uh, if I had to characterize those operations for you, I'd break it down a few different ways. Uh, for uh, regular operations, keeping the networks up, keeping the mainframe systems, the servers, things like that up and running, that's a, a fairly stable environment. And uh, even, even although it's stable, we're improving. Uh, you're gonna hear a little bit further on uh, some of the work that we're doing to put better measures in place. Uh, so we understand specifically what the expectations are placed on us by our agency partners and the areas that we might need to improve in uh, to provide even better service. Uh, customer support since phase one, uh, uh, effective July 1, we repostured the organization. The way I like to explain it is uh, we, we don't do IT for the sake of IT. We do IT for the sake of the business missions that we support. And so part of that reposturing was specifically to make sure that our eyes are on the customer service outcomes, not necessarily the technical outcomes uh, exclusively so. And so that's put us on a better posture to be more responsive. Uh, we've been improving our communications and government relations within the agency as well as between agencies and even with external stakeholders uh, who share things like cybersecurity information, recruiting and workforce information, and a variety of other IT data. Um, things that probably need some improvement in my view is that that coordination process is very nascent. Uh, it's really only been since July that we've made that a priority to refocus on. And so there are a number of different organizations that we work with uh, that we're still building stronger relationships with. I don't think we're ready to declare success on that yet. Uh, we're also working on updating our policies and procedures. One of the, one of the things I walked into earlier this year was uh, we, we hadn't kept our eye on that ball. Uh, and so I've set some expectations where I'd like to see our policies and procedures updated at least once a year so that people understand that they're current and they, they have confidence when they're following them. Uh, one of the things that we're doing as a prelude to that uh, new mission focus is we're putting in place interagency agreements, service level agreements that have specific quantitative requirements associated with them. So that uh, I think like Walt Whitman must have said one time, good fences make good neighbors. Uh, if there's any question about whether or not uh, we're meeting expectations or what the basis for our resource estimates or our budget requirements might be, I'm hoping that uh, we'll soon have the information available that we can demonstrate exactly uh, why we're making the requests on a quantitative basis rather than just a qualitative basis. Uh, there are some things with uh, portfolio management uh, that you'll be hearing about a little bit more when we talk about Barry Dunn uh, that needs some improvement. And as far as staffing goes, uh, you, you've just heard, I know, a great deal from A&I about the, the initiatives that they're leading. 
uh, if I had to characterize it uh, easily for the enterprise technology services, we have a bunch of rare skill type positions that we continually struggle with. Uh, that includes things like architects, cybersecurity analysts, portfolio managers, risk managers, project managers, and the type of work anticipated by the Barry Dunn recommendations, all of the analytic type skills. And it's not just a struggle uh, recruiting them, it's actually a, a struggle uh, with our current headcount accommodating some of those recommendations. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit further. Uh, at this point, let me, let me ask uh, Deputy Director Sheehan to speak to the um, computer technician study that was previously requested by this committee. Mr. Please Chairman, proceed. Timothy Sheehan, Deputy Director for ETS. Um, previously, this committee had requested ETS to look at the 80 or so agencies that are left behind in the agencies to see if it was warranted for further consolidation or not. Um, we, we decided to take a slower approach on this study, um, understanding there are impacts to the agency, the agency mission, and there are some, again, rare skills within those agencies um, serving that mission. Additionally, uh, some of the CT positions that were left behind aren't doing full-time IT work either. They may only be doing 20, 30, 40, 60%. Uh, so with that, uh, what we did is set up a two-tier review process uh, in this study. So we took an initial three team member to ingest that information and, and broke that out by sort of a function. We didn't want just sort of old guard ETS to look at the positions and say, yeah, come on over. Um, you know, there were some pain points from the previous consolidation, so we wanted to be a little bit more thoughtful. Uh, so in that, uh, we took somebody who was um, new to state government, has no history of the prior consolidation, we took an individual that had been consolidated in the previous consolidation, and then we also had somebody who is a long-term ETS employee do the initial scoring. Based on that initial scoring, we sort of did a red, yellow, green um, markup of those positions, red being, you know, we didn't think that's probably a smart idea to move them, yellow uh, in that category meaning maybe uh, needs a little bit further review, in green, based on the JCQ submitted by the agency, had a high probability of successfully transitioning. Uh, so after that, uh, we moved that to a seven-person team to basically validate that information. And so this week, uh, it is our intent to wrap up that study. Uh, we're going to submit that information over to the governor's office so we can further review um, if this is the right thing to do or not and, and come back with recommendations. And, and what kind of numbers are we talking about in your different categories that just just out of curiosity positions or however you're categorizing it? Uh, net, let's net see positions. if I can do some quick math on the fly oh, here. That's okay. uh, of the 80 positions, um, I think it broke down to 15 to 20 percent were in a um, in that green category. 60% uh, were in that yellow category, and then what does that leave? 15, 20% in that uh, red category. Okay, thank you. Please proceed. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'd like to get into uh, the follow up on the Barry Dunn report about IT governance. So, the Barry Dunn report recognized the need to strengthen enterprise IT governance. And part of the recommendations of that report were that the Office of the Chief Information Officer, in, in coordination with the Enterprise Technology Service Department, should enhance the capabilities uh, to assist agencies with more thorough review of their IT planning and request processes. Uh, IT planning, per the recommendations, should use agency business requirements as the principal need, driving uh, technical architectures, strategic vision, governance and change management. In support of these efforts, the OCIO is implementing IT governance in phases to include the establishment of two committees. One is the Enterprise Management Committee, and that will be a director level committee, uh, establishing uh, statewide policies uh, in collaboration, of course, and stewardship with the Chief Information Officer uh, to align business initiatives and enterprise initiatives and standards. The EMC will have a number of different subcommittees for data, cybersecurity, privacy, and GIS, for example, and we'll be able to charter other subcommittees as necessary. 
Uh, supporting the Executive Management Committee is going to be the Technology Investment Council. And the Technology Investment Council will be the subject matter experts that assess, advise, and monitor the existing technologies. They make recommendations for enterprise technology investments associated with whatever body of work might sit before the Executive Management Committee. And they're charged with making sure that for those business requirements that the alignment <coughs> between the specific technical requirements in each agency aligns with, with the enterprise at large. Part of the reason we focused on this was in looking at the Barry Dunn recommendations, uh, there, was a, there was a time, uh, and I, I might describe it as a sine wave rather than a homogenous line, where enterprise governance has been tried in the past. Uh, the most successful version, as recounted to me by other directors, was previously during a time where there was session law in place requiring something like that. Uh, but right now, there's, there's no executive orders, no statutes, no session law. There's nothing in place that requires coordination between agency directors and ETS regarding their technology uh, uh, acquisition requirements. And so we were looking at um, how do you put together a process that meets your requirements as well as uh, the governor's requirements and, and the business requirements. And, our goal is to try to find opportunities where we can increase the use of common acquisitions. Uh, we'd like to utilize governance to help reduce potential duplication and redundancy. We'd like to optimize the return on investment for IT programs and resources that might have more than one agency's requirements identified. <coughs> Excuse me. And we'd like to make sure that we have alignment between the IT portfolios at every agency and the one that we maintain at the enterprise level, and that that, that aligns with your expectations for oversight. Uh, the structure we're hoping to use is one that builds in accountability. So I, in con consultation with agency heads, would implement actions uh, to provide oversight to their investments. Uh, we might meet on something like a quarterly basis, a periodic basis, uh, to review the project, projects and programs under their care. Uh, we would do that in coordination with this new governance structure so that we have an opportunity to identify when things are going well and if things aren't going well that we have an early opportunity to intervene. We can, we can use that as an opportunity to conduct root cause analyses and then uh, determine what resolutions are required to bring things back on track. Of course, I would provide those updates to the governor as well as to uh, this committee and, and the Joint Appropriations Committee as you may be interested. Uh, we'll conduct periodic reviews of these programs. Uh, this, would, this would put the, the OCIO, ETS, and the agencies on a routine uh, basis uh, reviewing issues, any type of mitigation strategies, uh, hopefully not, but potentially recommending termination of investments if appropriate. And the corrective action plans and timelines that might be discussed uh, with the individual directors would be something that we would then coordinate for any kind of enterprise impacts through governance. Uh, just we, Director Veit, I think we have a question here. Something <clears throat> triggered a question you said, so if we'll just take them in order, if that's okay. Yes, appreciate Go ahead. it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director, just a quick question in, in regards to, um, I keep hearing the director level, um, and it, it's bringing up a, I used to work for DEQ, and so when I worked at DEQ, there was the director, of course, who has, uh, I'd say, a, you know, the availability to get into the weeds, but likely is re reminded very honestly that he is not in the IT world uh, very quickly. And so he has one or two IT staff that are there, and most of these larger agencies uh, tend to have these one or two IT staff that are down in the weeds. So when you say director level discussions, um, are you talking about strictly with the director or is this going to be something where you guys are working with these larger agencies and having these direct IT professionals that can that can actually map out what what's going on? Um, and the reason I'm asking is I can just I can just see, especially with the Department of Health, some of these larger agencies that have these very intricate agreements with these federal agencies, stuff like that, that um, this might be better handled um, with the IT professionals rather than the director level. I, I'm just kind of curious how you're going with that. Director Vida. Thank you, sir. I absolutely concur, sir. Uh, what I anticipate happening is that the program officials who are assigned to each one of these projects 
are working every day. So if it's a program official in a major agency and a program official at ETS, they'll be working and monitoring and managing the activities of that, that project and reporting out to their cognizant executive leadership. Uh, there's, a, there's an element of governance that, that we're going to have to characterize that, that is a, stratifies what major investments are from minor investments. And I anticipate that depending on how governance in the agency is delegated, not everything would come up to the agency director for review. But if, if for example, if you're spending $60 million on a project, that might require an agency director's approval to make any kind of changes to bring the, the timeline back in line. If you're spending $6,000 on a project, they might not need to see something like that. So there's a, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of broad brushing this, but there's a, there's a stratification, I think. And it, uh, it really speaks to how collectively as government we'd like to manage that. Uh, I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll, if I could, sorry, I'd like to hold that just for a second to the end. But uh, I don't anticipate every decision would go up to the, the director. I think that it would be stratified based upon the director's interest. If, if, they, if there's a, either in governance a threshold set for major investments versus minor investments, or if there's a will of the, of the director uh, to see to see anything or whatever level they would like to see it and I think we want to be flexible and provide them with that thank you thank you please proceed thank you um, so I project the outcomes on this is are, are that we're going to be maintaining laser-like focus on business requirements as opposed to the conveniences of IT uh, we're going to continue implementing the Barry Dunn recommendations uh, we're going to um, establish a way to enforce policies and procedures once we have them effectively updated. Uh, hopefully this will all reduce risk uh, associated with IT investments and it's gonna make sure that we have uh, full enterprise visibility and control of all the IT assets that we purchase every day. Now I'd, I'd mentioned a moment ago, sir, sir um, I, I believe that because there are no currently established statutes that substantiate uh, this, this discussion that we're having here, that we will require your support uh, per your previous comments uh, in putting some of these things into statute. So our anticipation is that along with ex executive orders and statutes and our new policies and procedures, uh, that will put uh, the, 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 the methodology in place, the framework in place that we need to sustainably support this kind of oversight and decision making as we go in the future. And so uh, at the request of the Joint Appropriations Committee, we're working with the governor's office to draft that language and we'd like to share it with you uh, when it's available. And that's all the prepared information I had today, sir. I'm okay, thank you. Committee, any questions from the committee? I guess um, you, you mentioned in continuing to implement the Barry Dunn, the report um, recommendations. So where do you think you, where do you think we are, we collectively are in implementing those things? I mean, I know the, some of the, the boots on the ground stuff may be further off, but where we are in actually implementing at least the, the broad picture stuff. Director. Thank you, sir. Uh, we conducted an analysis and we'd be glad to share that with you that, that shows in a hypothetical biennial time period, what all the major milestones and the decision gates and reporting would be uh, required by uh, both the executive and legislative branches, and then the, the time frame that CIO and ETS activity would be required to, to overlay, and we'd be glad to share that with you. Uh, if I had to characterize it, uh, I would say it's, it's nascent. Uh, the, the posture that the organization needed to take uh, to start working in accordance with the recommendations was completed on July 1st. Uh, we stood up the, the business management office. Uh, we stood up the communications and government affairs organization. And those organizations are largely charged with either the portfolio management functions, so the risk management functions for investment, the project management, the financial management, uh, the portfolio management functions and the communication of that. So we have about one one quarter under our belt of the organization existing and the first people coming on board. The challenges, as I was stating earlier, is those are relatively new skills uh, 
for state government and their rare skills in Wyoming. We'd prefer to recruit and hire uh, people from Wyoming before we look at any other solution. And uh, those type of rare skills are, are tough to find, uh, not just in Wyoming, but in government as well. So um, we're working on a strategy to make sure that we can address that. But we would pro we're probably at about 40% of where we'd like to be for final capability. So we're right in the beginning of stages. But I'm very hopeful from what I've seen so far. We have the tools, we have the data. We're starting to populate the, the tools with the data. Uh, we're seeing some of the fruits of those early labors in terms of our, our asset management capability, our financial oversight, and uh, the information required to inform interagency agreements and service level agreements. So we're on the right path, but it's still only three months that we've been working on it. Okay, thank you very much. Anything, any questions? Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, last time we talked, um, I had received a, a just basically a, a quick message from a friend who works um, for one of the agencies here, and there was discussion here, you know, about uh, being able to buy uh, surge protectors and the fact that surge protectors were being monitored and what was being run through uh, your guys' agency. And at that time, uh, we were going to uh, get some information back on that and what you guys are doing. I'm just kind of curious if there's been a purchasing uh, streamlining and what, what has occurred with that. Uh, certainly understand that we want to make sure that the integrity of our internal networks is safe. Uh, but I also want to make sure that government is efficient. We're not uh, nitpicking everything to the, to the nth degree, um, trying to stop you know, progress from being made. Please, Director or Deputy Director. Mr. Chairman, Representative Brown, uh, I anticipated that question and, and I, I think I do owe you an apology. I think I did mention I'd try to catch you offline and, and fail to do so, so I do apologize. Um, I'm gonna give you four sets of numbers, two of which you're really concerned about, but I think two of which are probably concerned for the, the committee as a whole. Um, we, we have, um, incident management, um, service requests, and then we have purchasing and contracts. And so what I can report on for our incidents, our average completion time, and this is a, a large number because it also includes long-term projects, but overall uh, incidents, so something broke, I can't access my, um, my file storage anymore. Um, five days, 19 hours and 29 minutes is the time to resolution. Uh, for a service request, I need something new. I would like a new email account or I would like a new server set up, for example. Um, five days, 19 hours and 27 minutes. Um, <coughs> on the purchasing, unfortunately, I don't have down to the days, hours and minutes on this one. The, the system doesn't report quite like that. Uh, but what I can tell you for OCIO approval for an IT purchase, uh, we are completing those in about uh, 48 hours now. Uh, and for contracts where we're doing the full review with our, say our data team, our security team, uh, the full internal review for a contract, uh, that's running about five business days. Uh, and then again, if it's a rather large contract, we will usually take the full 30 days on those contracts just to ensure we're dotting I's and crossing T's. Thank you. So maybe we do our protective surges now. All right, anything else from the committee? Anything else online? Is there anybody online for this? No? All right. Anything further for the committee? You, you said you might be coming forth with some requests to JAC. You'll forward that to our committee as well. That'd be appreciated. Um, just to be clear, are they, statu are they they're statutory type things or are they more budgetary footnote type things? Statutory Director? things, sir. Statutory. Oh, excuse me. Statutory. Okay. Perfect. All right. Well, we'll look forward to those. All right. Further business from the committee? Further questions from the committee? I guess you're off the hook pretty easy today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, everybody. Sir. Appreciate your work. All right, so we've been moving fairly quickly through our agenda. Is there anybody wanting to make public comment for anything we've covered this morning? Anybody in the room that wants to make public comment for anything that was covered this morning? See, no, sh no takers. 
I'm trying to, the 130 agenda item is mostly our staff. No, it has agency folks as well. I think we'll just stand in recess until the appointed time, which is uh, 130 by my agenda. So committee's in recess until 130. Thank you.